seat. We'll welcome Samuel up for his message today. Good morning. Ready to work? It's really uh, early in the morning, right? One hour early. Thank you for coming. I hope, I mean, it's okay. Feel free to fall asleep again. Okay, anyway. Uh, let's pray first, okay? Father God, we thank you for bringing us together. Thank you for uh, setting up church on this earth so that we can worship together. Father, please, as you have promised, be with us when we gather together. In Canada, 
uh, I have thought in such a peaceful and safe country, people will feel very relaxed, will feel at rest, but that's not the case, Father. I can see so many people, even the young people here in groups, they are anxious, they are weary, their hearts are fainted. Just like David says, when my heart groans weary inside me, I call to you from the ends of the earth. Guide me to the rock higher than me. Father, all of us here, we need you to guide us to the rock higher than us. Because we want to see clearly, we want to know what it is about ourselves and about our lives. As Isaiah said in chapter 43, verse 2, when we go through the waters, you will be with us. When we go through the rivers, we will not be swept over. When we go through the fire, we will not be get burnt. Some of us here are, go through, are going through the waters, the rivers, and the fire. Father, please be with us and uh, teach us with your words. Help us with your truth. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <coughs> All of us wants to be wise people, right? Even when we say, no, 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 I'd rather be foolish. Is that, is that strategy to be smart, right? Because by saying I am foolish, I'm stupid, actually we're saying, you know, I'm more smarter than you because I know how foolish I am. And actually we all want to be smart. But the point is, what is wisdom? Wisdom, what is it? Serious. All of us right here, we want to be wise. We want to have wisdom for our life, for our work, for our study, for whatever. So people come to church, people come to Christianity for truth, for wisdom. We think, well, you know, Christianity is all about wisdom, which is truth. And there is a particular book in the Bible. Among all the 66 books, there is a particular one named Proverbs. We all think, gosh, there are, there are wisdom in that particular book, which is also true. However, there are some problems and questions we need to deal with. Let's see the uh, scripture for today first. Proverbs chapter 1, verse 1 and 2. The Proverbs of Solomon, son of David, king of Israel, for attaining wisdom. So here comes the first question. Proverbs. What is it? Interestingly, you know, a proverb is called masal, masal in Hebrew language. It means a short, poetic saying that packs a lot of truth in just a few words. But sadly, sadly, for modern people, we don't have a category or equivalent for proverbs. We don't, we don't have a category, right? We don't normally say a proverb these days. The reason is because we want effectiveness and efficiency. Especially, we want instant effectiveness and efficiency. What does that mean? We tend to systemize, standardize, categorize things to make things more effective, including people as well. And also, the catchphrase for today is, I want it, and I want it now. So we don't have a category for Proverbs. But proverb is just like a hard candy. You cannot just uh, bite into it and expect to have all the flavor. If you really want to insist on doing that, you might even got a broken tooth. Instead, you need to savor it slowly like a hard candy, letting the sweetness of its insights sink in. So Proverbs are like a small a little nuggets of wisdom that offer insights into how the world works and how our life works. Because of the very nature, there are several things we need to know about Proverbs before we open that book, okay? First, Proverbs are not about absolute commands and promises, different than many people think. Proverbs are not com commandments and promises. No, they are not. 
they are not prescriptions about how life works. They are not prescriptions about how life works. Rather, they are observations about how life works. What does that mean? They help us understand reality better by encouraging us to think deeply and reflect our experiences. So it's not about prescription, it's about observation. So when you read the book of Proverbs, you should think, no, it's not about how things should go. It's about how things do go in our real life. So number two, Proverbs are often partial. They're partial. And they need to be considered alongside other Proverbs to get a full picture. That's very important. There is a story in ancient China or India or per Persian Gulf, I, I don't know. There's an ancient king. He wants to have all the wisdom in the world. So he sent out his uh, ministers around the world to collect all the wisdom because he wants to be the wisest person in the world. And when they come back, they collected all the wisdom of the world and packed the whole house of books. So the king got mad. He said, no way, I cannot do that. Make it simpler. Make it simple. So they compiled the whole wisdom into like 20 books. The king said, no, it's still too much. So they worked harder, make it into one book, thinking maybe the king will be satisfied this time, but the king was still unhappy. He said, no, I don't have time. You guys know how many wives a king has, right? So he said, no, one book is e even one book is more than enough. I cannot do that. Guess what? Eventually, his ministers said, okay, we got it. We got all wisdom in one sentence. Guess what's that? Have a guess. All wisdom in the world in one sentence. <sighs> you want it? I will not charge anything for free. All wisdom in the whole world in one sentence. Guess what's that? Have a guess. Come on. And the king was very, very happy. He's going to be the wisest person in the world with one sentence. And when he opened the book, there's only one sentence. There is no free lunch in the world. <laughs> <laughs> Having said that, it means there is no one single principle to rule the world because our world and life are complicated. There's no one single rule. So if you, if you want to open the Bible, and even the Bible, even the book of Proverbs, and you want to find one sentence or two and say, wow, I got it. I know the secrets to life. I know the secrets to success. Good luck. No, that's not, that's not the way the world runs. That's not the way the life works, okay? Our world and our life are complicated because of what? Serious. Our world and our life are complicated because the world is full of human beings. Say that with me, human beings. It's you and me. <laughs> Why? Why? Human beings are complicated. Why? Are you complicated? Don't tell me you're a simple person. Come on. I'm old enough to, <laughs> to not believe such rubbish, okay? Human beings are complicated because human beings are fickle and we are unpredictable. Agree? We are fickle and we are unpredictable. However, rules and principles are all about what? Rules and regulations are all about principles, are all about what? Doctor, our doctor, our new doctor, what does, what does rules and principles, serious, what does rules and principles mean? Rules and principles means predictability, right? Predictability, but thanks to human beings, the world is not predictable at all, at least from human perspective. So you may ask the question, in, if that's the case, what's the value of a proverb then? 
what's the value of a proverb, right? We cannot predict anything. There's no one single rule to rule our life and the world. Okay, let me tell you. The point of a proverb is to help us get rightly related to reality. Say it again. The point of a proverb is to help us get rightly related to reality. Different than many think, wisdom in most cases is not about deep thinkers thinking about metaphysical or abstract things, but more about how ordinary people getting through daily life, just like you and me. That's wisdom. There is another word for getting rightly related to reality, and the word is wisdom. Wisdom, get rightly related with reality. That's wisdom. So the former U.S. First Lady, Eleanor Roosevelt, she once said, never mistake knowledge for wisdom. One helps you make a living. The other helps you make a life. Many of us here, we have bachelor's degree, master's degree, or at least we are in high school, right? <laughs> at least we are in high school. You have some knowledges. You have some skills. You know how to make a living. At least you can work part-time in a bubble tea shop, right? Earn some money. You know how to make a living. But we, if we are honest enough, we don't know how to make a life. Because making a life requires wisdom, not knowledge. Okay, so here comes the second question. Wisdom, what is it? The word wisdom in Proverbs, the Hebrew word is chakma, chakma. It has twofold meanings. The first one is pretty boring, morality. So the first aspect of wisdom is being moral. However, the second part of the word wisdom, chakma, means more than just being moral. So wisdom have twofold of meanings, being moral and more than moral. What does that mean? First, let's see, Mor being moral is very important. However, we have uh, so many misunderstandings about morality, right? So, okay, my friends, just be honest, okay? When we say morality, what pops up in your mind? Come on. What pops up when you say morality? Right or wrong? What else? Pardon? Human condition. Wow. And you guys all got A plus in seminaries. Oh, let me ask you this way, this way. When we say morality, what kind of feelings do you have? How do you feel when we say morality? How do you feel? Pressure. That's good. I like it. And what? So good and right, good and bad, right and wrong make you pressured. Wow, that's good. How do you feel, Angel? Yeah. I won't have nothing to do with it. Right? <laughs> okay, to me, the feeling is morality means rules and regulations, means restrictions, right? Sort of like the enemy of freedom, right? Whatever feeling you may have, I bet most of them are negative, not very positive, right? About morality. Although, just like what our friend says, Tati says, right or wrong, but still, I don't feel good about it. <laughs> you see, that's very funny. That's good. First, the distortion of morality. Actually, you're right, Tadi, my dear friends. Morality simply means what is good and bad, what is right and wrong. So basically, okay, let me give you an for instance. So basically, one plus one equals two, right? One plus one equals two is a moral answer, semantically. Serious. Semantically, if you say one plus one equals two, will you feel pressured? I'm really pressured to say one plus one equals two. You won't. 
See, basically, this is the meaning of morality. Means that's a moral answer. You can say that semantically. One plus one equals two is a moral answer. More specifically, morality is about what is right or wrong, good or bad, in interpersonal relationships. And we can use another term, proper, right? We say proper answer, proper. So basically, that's morality, good and bad, right or wrong. That's very good, right? So, but my dear friends, there's something I need to remind you of. Knowledge is neutral. Do you agree? People are thinking, Sammy is setting me up. <laughs> Come on. Knowledge is neutral. Do you agree? Okay, let me tell you something, please. Knowledge is neutral only in theory. Knowledge is neutral only when it is not used. <laughs> Once knowledge is used, it's not neutral at all. So what's the use of a knowledge if it is not used? Are you confused now? So actually in practice, knowledge is never neutral. It's never ever neutral, please. Give me a break if you say no. If you insist on knowledge is neutral, give me a break. That's either naivi naivety or evil. Plato, the Greek, the Greek philosopher, he said, knowledge without justice ought to be called cunning rather than wisdom. I like it. See? Knowledge without justice ought to be called cunning rather than wisdom. And his student, Aristotle, his student, Aristotle, says, true virtue is not without practical wisdom, and practical wisdom is not without virtue. So bear in mind that knowledge is never neutral in use. Okay, first, this, that's distortion of morality. There has to be good and bad. There has to be right and wrong. Okay, one plus one equals two. Second, more important, the deficiency of morality. Morality is important, especially to religious people, right? They say, wow, morality, of course it's important. But, by the way, please quote me correctly, okay? Otherwise, <laughs> it's your responsibility. Quote me right, please. Morality is important, but morality is not that important in that it cannot deal with everything. Morality is important, but morality is not that important in that, in that morality is not enough at all in deal with the complexity of life. Why? Because life is complicated. Life is more than just right or wrong, good and bad. That's where we are so anxious about. Hey, okay, my, my dear friends, tell me, Think about something really bothers you for the pa in the past week. I mean, something you, uh, you, uh, you were really anxious. Is it about something right or wrong, good or bad? Serious. Not exactly, right? You are anxious about something which you just cannot say, mm, no, good or bad, right or wrong. That's your headache. That's the reason why you cannot fall asleep. That's the reason, but morality can do nothing about it. Here comes the second part of wisdom. Wisdom is about making the right choices, even when there are no clear rules to follow about what is right or wrong or what is good or bad. That's the beauty of wisdom, making decisions, even when there are no clear rules to follow. How to do that? We are so accustomed, we are so used to follow rules or break rules. But when there are no rules, what should we do? That's wisdom. So here comes, here comes to the decision-making process. Okay, about decision-making, 
actually some decision makings are not very hard as long as we are not that lazy or stubborn. Some decision making are really simple as long as we are not let that lazy or stupid. For example, sometimes you need to make decisions based on what you know. Simple, right? Like what kind of matter, wh what medicine shall I take? You just need to know. You, you can talk to Wiki. Wiki, I want to have this medicine, that medicine. You know, the during my wife's treatments, we have uh, access to all kinds of medicine. I, I cannot even pronounce the names. It doesn't bother me at all. I just go to the pharmacy and say, I want this medicine. That's it. We don't know what how it works, wha what that means. We just take it. We follow instructions and we, we make our decisions, right? So for s so many decisions in our lives, we just follow, we just based on what we know. Our doctor told us, do it, and I do it. Buy this medicine, I buy that. That's very simple. For example, if you want to have kimchi for lunch, where would you go? Will you go to a steakhouse like a CAG or Montana? No, you'll go to a Korean restaurant, right, for sure. If you want to have German sausages for dinner, where would you go? Will you go to Xiaofeiyang, Sichuan hot pot restaurant? No, you will not. You know it's not there, right? So you make the first, you make decisions based on what you know. That's very simple as long as you are not lazy. You should find out. Second, we make decisions by following certain rules. We just follow the rules. For example, no jaywalking, right? No jaywalking, stop at the traffic lights. Sometimes, you know, I'm a, my, my professor in the seminary told me, Samuel, you have a criminal mindset. I don't know what that means, but anyway, you know, many times when I stop at the, cra uh, the traffic lights, I'm wondering, there's no other vehicles at the crossroads. Why cannot I just cross it? Why well, can't? It hurts nobody, right? In postmodern society, our philosophy is as long as it doesn't hurt. Why, why cannot I cross it? Because why can't? So how many tickets have you received? <laughs> See? <laughs> That's very funny. So some decision making, right? When I, when, when I see the red light, I don't bother to ask why. Just follow. Stop. Right? Stop. And pick up my phone. <laughs> see? So decision making, these two types of decision making are really easy. First one is, I know what I need to do. What kind of medicine? Which restaurant? The second one is, follow the rules. No jaywalking. Why? There's no people in the road. Why shouldn't I just cross over? It saves time. But we just don't. Follow the rules. But, but, here comes the problem. But there are many other decisions in our life. Many, 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 many other decisions in our lives where there is no clear answers. Can you give me a for instance? There are many, many, way more things, choices in our lives. There are no clear answers. Okay, let me give you a for instance. Okay, you guys will be interested first. Where to live? Why do you guys choose Kinkora? Is it biblical? <laughs> okay, you follow Charles instead of Jesus Christ. Come on. <laughs> I'm just kidding, see? Where to live? There's no biblical rules to do that, right? You cannot say living in the northwest is holy, whereas living in the southeast is a sin. <laughs> no, I definitely know living in Cochrane is not good enough, typically, right? <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> See? Okay, how about who to marry? Shall I marry a Chinese girl, Korean girl? No, marry a Korean girl is a sin. It's not biblical, tardy. You need to repent. There's no rule, right? Shall I marry a sling girl or a sexy girl? Is there a biblical rule to follow? See? And 
which job to take. Shall I work in a school, in a company, or self-employed? There are no clear rules. How should we do? But we all know that our lives are shaped by these sort of decisions, right? Our lives are shaped where to live, who to marry, which job to take. Wiki, your life changed after married? Chi? Is it biblical? I don't know. Jessica? Who to marry? <laughs> See? Other examples, we still can. We have a lot, lots and lots of examples like that. For example, when you suddenly come into unexpected money, or when you lose your job, what do you do? That will not make things worse. There are so many bad things happen, happening after we come into some unexpected income or after we lose our jobs, right? Making the wrong choices in the above situations can be really bad, but there are not always rules to help us out. Plus, there are character traits like being impulsive, being sensitive, being defensive or disorganized that can also mess up our lives, though they are not explicitly against any rules, right? <laughs> you cannot say being sensitive is a sin. <laughs> you never made, made your bed is a sin. No, it's not a sin. <laughs> See? I never wash dishes in time. Is it a sin? But our lives can be messed up. Our lives can be messed up. Just as we misunderstand Proverbs, we also misunderstand wisdom, especially Christians. We misunderstand wisdom. We tend to think, you know, if especially for Christians, at least so-called Christians, we, are, we tend to be smug about our right beliefs. We believe, Christian belief, is all about truth, and truth gives us wisdom, which is true. But the fact is, even when we do have the right belief, even when we do have the truth, we don't know how to use it. We don't know how to use it. Do you really know how to use what the Bible says? On the other hand, there are so, so many seemingly self-inflicted verses in the Bible. What would you do? Dear, we think, many Christians, we are so naive to think God or the Bible or the church or the pastors or the leaders or other mature believers would simply tell us what to do through some specific Bible verses. Or may just let us hear some mysterious inner voices. <laughs> How many of you pray for inner voices every morning to know what to do? Come on. Let me tell you what's that. That's superstition. That's superstition. If you rely on that. I'm serious. Please. I do not mean there's no, there will never be voices, but if you think that's the way, that's the only way you got things. I mean, that's superstitions. That's, mis uh, that's all misunderstandings about God, truth, and wisdom. Many people come to the church and gods and hope they can find wisdom about who to marry, where to live, which job to take, which school should I apply for? And they got disappointed, frustrated, and angry with God. Serious, how many of you today come into the church with the question, who to marry, where to live, <laughs> which job to take? You want to find the wisdom, right? And, and have you got the answer? Are you angry? You are a little bit, right? Frustrated, at least. But, 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 my dear friends, 
Wisdom doesn't work that way. Wisdom doesn't work that way. Doesn't. Sorry. We misunderstand wisdom because we misunderstand truth. That's very important. I hope you, if you have been falling asleep, please wake up now because that's not the important part. We misunderstand wisdom because we misunderstand truth. It's correct that wisdom is rightly related to reality, meaning we relate to the reality with truth. So, for us to be rightly related to reality, we first need to be rightly related to truth. I'm sorry, it's a bit awkward. But truth, please, truth is a person, not some code, objective rules, or principles. Truth is a person, my dear friends. If you call yourself a Christian and thinking you are looking into the Bible to find some objective truth, you are wrong horribly wrong. If the Bible can tell us one thing, it says, truth is a person. His name is Jesus. See? Book of John, chapter 14, 6. Jesus himself said that. I am the way, what, and truth, and life. Let me tell you something, my dear friends. If you happen to be curious about the difference between Christianity and all other religions, one thing. All other religions, they're the boss. Let's say the bosses claim they have the truth. Only Christianity, our boss, <laughs> our Lord says, I am the truth. It's very different. Jesus never said, I have truth. He said, I am the truth. Think about it. Think about it. I cannot explain that. I'm sorry. I can't. But please, okay, I, I will try my best. Okay, so, my dear friends, rightly related. You know, to be rightly related to reality means to be rightly related to truth. And to be rightly related to truth means we be rightly related to Jesus. That's very important. That's very important. Or let me give you a for instance. Let me give you a for instance. In truth and roots, I think Jessica is going to give a counseling, like a training for those, I'm sorry, for the teenage, teenagers' parents. Hey, so teenagers, if you really want Jessica to speak for you, you know what to do, right? I'll leave her phone number to you guys. <laughs> Let's just tell you something. Me and my wife, we have we have been doing the parental counseling and marriage counseling for many years. And one funny yet very sad thing we realize is so many people come to us for secrets to marriage and parenting, but they don't want to know how to get along with the spouse or their children. They want to know the secrets about parenting and marriage, but they don't want to bother to build a relationship with the very person. Do you think that's ironic? It's the same in Christianity. You guys, I mean, we open the Bible, we come to the church, we listen to everything, and we want to have the truth, but we don't want to have a personal relationship with Jesus. That's so. It's ironic. Okay, for us to be rightly related to Jesus, what does that mean? The first step is to be rightly related to God. In, in the Bible, there is a special word. There is a special word for being, recon being reconciled to God. What does being reconciled to God? It means receiving from God uh, uh, the new life. Receiving from God the new life through Jesus. And then uh, receive the calling to grow with me new life into a wise person who discerns what to do. Hey, my dear friends, let me tell you something. There is something you can never know about another person without true love. Let me say that again. There is something about another person you will never know without truly love him or her. 
And that's the tragedy of the modern marriages. That is, for those who are married, please let me tell you, we have seen, my wife has, <laughs> my wife has done marriage counseling many couple of times and uh, I happened to sit alongside her and uh, notice those couples. The funny thing is people say, oh gosh, we have been married uh, 20, 30, 40 years, we know each other. And the other part, the other party is like, no, you don't know me. <laughs> I was like, what's wrong? The funny thing is often, uh, many often, I, 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 I told my wife, okay, I know, I know, I know what you want. So my wife always responds, really? <laughs> I was like, serious? We've been dating since we were 18. Of course I know you, but my wife says, really? Do you really know your wives? Do you really know your husbands? There is something about love, something about knowing only love. So, I mean, on the contrary, that's very funny. We have been, we have helped some divorced couples. And one interesting finding, those couples, they know how to attack the other person, how to hurt the other person. They know exactly how to <laughs> piss them off. I, I, I just can see that. They, they, just, they just know how to piss him off or piss her off. They know what kind of words, what tone. When I use, I'll piss them off. Piss them off. However, they will never use that to help them. Why? And guess, my dear friends, for those who are want to be in love, for those who want to have a healthy marriage, do you know... What's the most hurting words in marriage and in the divorce? What's the most hurting words? Like a nuclear bomb. Number one. Guess. Have a guess. I never loved you. Although, wait, 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 wait. Although, we all know it's not true. If you never loved a person, why why do you get married? We know they say that to piss us off, but it's still, it hurts. Why? Because love. See, I never loved you. That's the nuclear bomb in marriage. So there is something you can never ever know about another person without truly love them. The same with God and Jesus. There is something about Jesus. There's something about God you will never ever know about if you don't love him. So that's why there are so many smart, very clever, smart scholars who are not Christians. They do research about the Bible. They do research about Christianity, but they cannot know Christianity. That's the point. You have to know the very person. So my dear friends, my question here for you is, see, please, he, what, God, what does God say? God say, says, it's because of him, him is God, we are in Christ Jesus. Say that. Who has become for us wisdom from God? Jesus is the very wisdom from God to us. If you really want to find wisdom, you need to be rightly related to Jesus. If you want to be rightly related to Jesus, you have to be reconciled to God. You have to have some genuine love for God. Otherwise, you can, I mean, coming to the church, doing some uh, church work, I mean, small groups, Bible study, they are not helpful at all. They are not. They are not. At the end of today's message, I have two questions, my friends. One for non-Christian friends, the other for Christian friends. For non-Christian friends, <coughs> if wisdom is all about being rightly related to reality, let me ask you, how would you know the reality rightly first? How would you know the reality you know is right? How would you decide what's good and bad? 
what's wrong and what's what's right and wrong? I mean, how how would you decide if you say, "Oh, come on, Samuel, you are so outdated. You are so out old school." There's no right and wrong. Okay, if there's no right and wrong, and everybody can do what they whatever they want, why do you have so many problems in your life for your choices? If there are no right and wrong, you shouldn't be have problems. Why? Why do you have so many problems with your choices? And why do you say somebody or something is wrong? How many of you here said that somebody is wrong in the past week? Why? There's no right and wrong. You're so selfish, bigot. You're racist. You're sexist. <laughs> you cannot say somebody is wrong if there is no right and wrong. How? Why? If you are non-Christian, serious, please seriously consider that. Okay, if you are Christian, let me ask you this question: Is Jesus a living friend and companion in your daily life, or is he just a historic figure, a Bible character, or a fictitious deity? Your answer to this question determines how, if your Christianity belief is a religion. Or a life of faith. How would you keep yourself in Christ? How would you keep yourself in Christ? How would you follow Him and be His disciples? How would you build a very personal relationship with Jesus? That's the essence of Christianity, and that's the only way to true wisdom. Let's pray. I'm serious. Please think about it. Okay, my difference is, it yeah. Close our eyes. Think about it. Jesus Christ, you said, you are the way, the truth, and life. What does that mean? So often we come to you for truth. We want you to shed light. We want you to give us some insights, know-how <laughs> about life. But you don't. You said, I am the truth. You are the wisdom from God. What does that mean, Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit? Help us open our eyes so that we can really see with the eyes of our hearts. God, we know we are so stubborn. We are so stubborn, but you always takes initiatives. Father, I ask you now to take initiatives with every one of us here. Help us reconcile with you. To help us reconcile with you. To help us to be rightly related with you. Help us in Jesus' name. We pray. Amen. Thank you, Samuel. And then you know, I'll just ask everyone to rise and let's sing the response.
Christ is born to me. Grab a seat, and we have some announcements. Some announcements for you guys. Um, so, uh, first of all, it's our uh, we have our gym night, and, and that's on Saturday, uh, March twenty fifth. So, if you're in uh, youth and you, you wanted to even invite a friend, you can also do that, and then you can talk to Johnny, talk to uh, Andrew about it, and then enjoy. Uh, Activities with friends and fellowship. Okay, and then we have lunch and just in the lunch room. So if you wanted to grab a pizza, uh, share a couple of words with friends and catch up, and you can do do so um, do so later. Okay, in the kitchen, and as well as we have our s uh, setup. Um, so if you would like to give a hand, support our support roots in uh, our um, the little thing. Um, so you can, you are welcome to do that. To to help us set up chairs on Sunday, maybe uh, set up sound, maybe even just uh, give a hand to the worship team, like carry some I equipment. Uh, any help that you give are greatly appreciated, and that that we give all the glory to God. And yeah, that we work together as one church. Okay, and uh, offering. So if you would like to give again. Um, this is a place for your home and wanted to give so that we can um, run and then we can really to to give back to God, to show him that we know and that we wanted to um, rely on him and then to really reconcile with him, right? So we um, put our trust in him and then even for our hardest thing, even for our finances, we say, that whatever we give to God, that we know that God, God will bless it and uh, he'll use it for good. And I am still taken care of. 
like anybody, any other, any nature, uh, that God has already cared for you and um, uh, loved you okay, and saved us as well. Okay, so that's the end of our service. Uh, thank you all for coming and have a wonderful week.